on this edition of the Fifth Estate, a question you might think medical science would have answered long ago. It goes to the fundamental question is, what is death? When are you dead? For doctors in Canada's organ transplant system, it's about ensuring trust. To me, one of the fundamental foundations of any donation system, that the public trusts that you're gonna to try to save life until you can't, and then if somebody's gonna die, that's when they become a donor. But some frontline physicians worry in the all-important drive to save lives through organ transplants. Are we pushing ethical boundaries? Some physicians, including myself, believe there is still genuine debate about whether the organ donors are already dead. A young man so close to death, his family agrees to donate his organs until... When we were all holding his hand, uh, he did, there was definitely some change in his grasp. I remember trying to communicate with them. Guys, I'm okay, I'm here, I'm fighting, I'm gonna make it, and I couldn't, no matter what I tried. And a young woman, her case also seemingly hopeless, her mother under pressure to donate her organs. What a person who is donating the organs, would they be able to feel that? Well, that's an awful thing to think about. Ahead, how we define death in Canada, and what is dead enough. Hello, I'm Bob McEwen. Welcome to the Fifth Estate. It is something many of us simply may take for granted. Signing the organ donor pledge on our driver's license, or online, or on a provincial donor card. It's also, perhaps, the most profound act of generosity anyone can make. The promise that when we die, we'll give someone else, likely a total stranger, a desperately needed liver or kidney, even a heart, and possibly a whole new life which is what makes the current debate behind the scenes in Canadian medical circles so important and troubling. It revolves around a question that could affect any of us, and that is remarkably unresolved. How do doctors decide whether someone who's promised to donate their organs is dead or still alive? It was September 9th, 2006, a Saturday night in Vancouver an evening out with friends for 25-year-old Shane Becker. He was a college student and an outstanding rugby player in the prime of life, health, and physical fitness. That is, he was, until it happened. Leaving a party at the rowing club in Stanley Park, Becker lost his balance and plummeted 20 feet onto the seawall below, severely injuring his head and brain. Paramedics tried but couldn't revive him. Shane's mother, Donna, rushed to Vancouver General Hospital. She arrived about 1 a.m. and was told her son would not recover, that his brain was not yet dead, but soon would be. We were given the impression there was no hope and he was nearly fatal. A nurse by profession, when Donna saw the medical evidence of her son's devastated brain, she knew what it meant. His condition, as they indicated, was very grave. And um, uh, we had occasion to look at the CT scan, and we were informed, basically, there was no hope and that he was, what we would say, brain dead. As she struggled with the awful news, she was approached by a hospital social worker. She said, uh, would you be interested in signing the organ donation certificate? I just made a decision I would do so, knowing Shane would have wanted me to. The prognosis for Shane Becker's brain injury was hopeless, but the rest of his body was virtually unaffected by the accident. A healthy young man with vital organs, liver, kidneys, heart, and lungs, that could save someone else. In the middle of the night at Vancouver General, Shane was on life support in the ICU, his family gathering around, told he was slipping into death. The medical team recommended withdrawal of life support, after that, death could be declared, and only then could the organ transplant team take over. In Canada, it takes place approximately 2,000 times a year. Organs transplanted from donors to recipients who desperately need them. But annually, 4,000 Canadians don't get organs they need and remain on transplant waiting lists. Each year, 300 of them will die waiting. 
and organ donor rates here lag far behind those in the U.S. and Europe. It's all why there's growing pressure across the country to expand the pool of prospective donors and to increase the number of organs available for transplants. Many of the transplants here at the University of Alberta Health Center in Edmonton follow cases of severe head trauma, injuries that can lead to death, yet leave internal organs untouched and therefore prime candidates for transplant. Here, as everywhere in Canada, there's what's known as the dead donor rule. Organs cannot be procured until after a donor has died. The U of A's critical care director is Dr. David Zegan. If I don't need my organs anymore because I have an irreversible injury and I am dead, I want to donate. Um, so when are you dead? And I have to admit, before I got involved in this, it, it never really was relevant. But donation makes it relevant because um, the dead donor rule states that, um, that you should be dead before the organs are retrieved. So it becomes very relevant. But as you'll see, a major problem in Canada is how to pinpoint the time of death after which organ procurement can begin. The challenge is death is a process. And when it's a process, taking it to one specific time is very difficult. As definitive as that dead donor rule might sound in practice, it can vary drastically from place to place, even hospital to hospital. So you're an organ donor and you're being kept alive on a respirator in the ICU. How long is it before you're officially declared dead and your organs can be extracted? Well, it turns out that may depend less on medical science than on your postal code. For example, one national guideline to pronounce death in Canada is to wait at least five minutes after artificial life support is withdrawn and the heart stops. In Toronto, that's the policy at Sunnybrook Hospital and Toronto General. But if the ambulance happens to take you across town to St. Michael's Hospital, they have a different standard and transplantation can't start for a full 10 minutes after your heartbeat ends. Visiting Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, there, it's only two minutes until your organs can be removed. In Denver, Colorado, just 75 seconds. And some in Europe have gone the other way. Italy, for example, waits at least 20 minutes after your heart stops before death can be declared. But back in Canada, there's another layer of complication. In most provinces, you can be considered dead when your heart stops, cardiac death. But in three provinces, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and New Brunswick, you're only dead when your brain stops, brain death. And regardless of what the provinces say, individual hospitals can make their own decisions. Foothills in Calgary accepts only brain death. The University of Alberta Hospital in Edmonton recognizes both brain and cardiac death. So how did life's most fundamental fact, death, come to this? Postal code death. Post death by postal code, exactly. Yeah, it could very well be that case. And that doesn't line up with what most people think death is. They think, well, it's the same standard everywhere. Jacqueline Shaw is a Halifax health lawyer, one of few who've studied the evolving definition of death in Canada and what triggered it, the critical shortage of vital organs for transplant. Canada's donation rate was not as, as great as it, it needed to be, where they could easily use 50% more organs than they had. So in 2005, something dramatic was needed. As we'll show you when we return, that's exactly what we got. A new protocol to ensure more organ donations. But for some doctors, it came with troubling questions. I think the public should know that some physicians including myself, believe there is still genuine debate about whether the organ donors are already dead. And I remember just waking up, seeing my sister, and just the reality was like, these lungs aren't mine. I'm breathing someone else. I'm breathing easier because someone else has lived. It was Easter weekend, 2012, and 
a 20-year-old from Ottawa was spending it in a Toronto hospital room. She'd been waiting for a double lung transplant for several months, told that without it, she would die. And Elaine Campbell could feel her time running out. That Thursday morning, I was at about 6% lung capacity. It was going down, breathing was hard. I didn't have the energy to talk to people. It felt like I was drowning. But then her doctor came through the door with some life-saving news. He's like, yeah, um, seriously though, we have lungs, they're not the best. Um, it will be a longer recovery. Um, do you want them? <laughs> and I was like, uh, <laughs> uh, heck yeah. Baby, baby, ooh. This was Alain Campbell in the months leading up to her operation when she turned to the internet for help. Put it on Facebook, Flickr, Tumblr. A social media campaign to recruit new organ donors, all too aware the new lung she needed might not arrive in time. I knew that every three days someone in Ontario passes away not receiving the organ that they need, and there's a shortage. If you sign up today, you're giving someone like me a second chance at survival. Soon, she was a cyber star, enlisting support for the cause from celebrities like Justin Bieber on Twitter and an unexpected visit on Skype from TV host Ellen DeGeneres. Hi! Surprise! Her campaign is credited with inspiring thousands of new organ donors before someone's selfless gift of their lungs saved her. And I remember just waking up, seeing my sister, and just the reality was like, these lungs aren't mine. I'm breathing. Someone else, I'm breathing easier because someone else has lived. Ten months later, she fulfilled her promise to dance live on the Ellen TV Show. Ellen Campbell is alive today because of organ donation. But there are hundreds more people in Canada who die on waiting lists. And that's created an acute need to increase the number of donors and organs. It's why in 2005 there was a landmark meeting of the Canadian organ transplant community, doctors, researchers, government health officials, to redefine death so more vital organs could be donated and procured, as the U.S. had done about a decade before. For years, the measurement of when we die in Canada had been brain death, the end of all brain function. But as of that 2005 meeting, there was a new standard for organ donation based on the irreversible cessation of heartbeat, called donation after cardiac death, or DCD. Okay, Matt, why don't you just tell us about the case and the Dr. Sam Shemi of McGill University is an intensive care specialist at the Montreal Children's Hospital, a driving force behind the Canadian effort to save lives through transplants. He says the demand for DCD came from families frustrated by Canada's reliance on brain death alone as the prerequisite for organ donation. Matt, he's three weeks post-op, right? But we had families who, in fact, uh, children were going to die um, who had catastrophic injury but weren't brain dead. They would say to me, okay, well, my son's going to die. Uh, uh, can, can he donate organs? Because that's what he wanted to do. And we would say prior to 2005, uh, no, in this country, we don't do that. The key issue in intensive care units across the country, where end-of-life decisions take place daily, is that time is crucial if the patient is an organ donor, because vital organs rapidly deteriorate when blood flow ends. But under the new definition of DCD, cardiac death can be pronounced in as little as five minutes after it's clear a patient will not recover. The family decides to turn off artificial life support and the heart stops. According to Dr. Sam Shemi, DCD in Canada has accomplished exactly what was intended and needed. And since that time, I can tell you the DCD story in Canada has been uh, successful in terms of uh, uh, providing transplants that otherwise wouldn't occur have occurred. DCD has accounted for over 1,000 transplants in this country that otherwise would never have occurred. But DCD also has triggered an intense debate in medical circles, the one with little public awareness about who's dead and what is not dead enough for organ donation. There is genuine debate uh, about whether the DCD donors are already dead at the time organ donation occurs. 
Intensive care specialist Ari Jaffe of the Stollery Children's Hospital in Edmonton. And I don't want to uh, be misinterpreted uh, because I do definitely support organ donation. But I have concerns about the process involved in DCD. One of Jaffe's biggest concerns is the five minute waiting period. Remember, that's the national guideline for how long doctors should wait after the heart stops before declaring someone dead and proceeding with organ removal. And the question is, is that state irreversible at five minutes? And I would argue no. Uh, we know in other settings that after absent circulation for five minutes, if we try medical intervention like CPR and resuscitation, that we often can resuscitate the patient. And that means it was not an irreversible state. I would argue that the state is not irreversible until at least 20 or 30 minutes. And the dilemma there is that the quality of the organs donated would not be adequate. It's a dilemma because the transplant clock is ticking. Doctors need to harvest organs within two hours or they may deteriorate beyond use, but organs degrade at different rates. So the timing is crucial. Physicians worry that puts pressure on everyone. Critical care specialist, Dr. David Zegan. The challenge I find with DCD is that all of those considerations of donation necessarily have to start before death. And uh, I think that sets up potential conflict of interest. He says it all makes the declaration of death a much more delicate balancing act between ICU physicians trying to prolong the patient's life on one hand and a transplant team hoping to save other lives through organ donation. But Dr. Shemi of McGill maintains there should be no conflict as long as physicians follow the Canadian guidelines on DCD. The first sacrosanct rule in, in organ donation in this country, it's a moral rule and it's a law that there needs to be strict separation of teams. The transplant team, the transplant doctors, and the transplant surgeons can have no role. They have absolutely no role in the management of the dying process or in death determination. That's a moral rule, that's separation, and it's law in this country. So the treating team is separate from the transplant team. But in the ICU, those lines can blur, leading to pressure to declare death prematurely so organ procurement can begin, according to Dr. Ari Jaffe. Although we're not the surgeons that are taking the organs, we're still part of the transplant team. My concern is that I don't think we can uh, uh, separate those processes as clearly as um, has been stated. And if physicians can feel that pressure, what about the families being asked to make life or death decisions for their loved ones? Consider the case of Brandis Thompson, a young woman from Calgary critically brain injured and paralyzed in a car crash. At her daughter's bedside around the clock, Sharon Thompson says she was canvassed for organ donation and asked to think about when life support should end. And I think when people are in an emotional state, I don't think that's the time to be asking those questions because the huge, the, the emotional roller coaster we were on for, I would say, at least three of those six weeks, that's not a great time to be having to make that decision too because you're not thinking clearly as to what this is really going to look like. At that point, the issue was not by which standard Brandis might be declared dead, brain or heart, but that either way, she would be an ideal organ donor. Given the pressures on her mother and her own amazing recovery, today Brandis can't help but wonder what might have happened if her mom had agreed to take her off life support. What I think is awful is the thought that if someone wasn't completely brain dead, before they were donating their organs, they may be able to feel, not necessarily feel, but in their mind, know what is going on. If they aren't completely brain dead, then to some extent their mind is gonna know what's going on when those organs are being taken from them. Would I be able to feel it? Or would a person who is donating the organs, would they be able to feel it? Well, that's an awful thing to think about. 
Which takes us back to 2006 at the intensive care unit of Vancouver General Hospital, where 25-year-old Shane Becker was on an artificial respirator, his brain injury deemed hopeless. Remember, Shane's mother, a nurse, had consented to the donation of his organs, and it was recommended the family decide to withdraw life support. But there was a delay. And it was important for us that they, we wait. Important, because Shane's father was out of town. It would take hours on the road back to Vancouver before he could say his final goodbye. Until then, everything else would have to wait. It would be a fateful decision. After the break, for organ donation in Canada, lessons from the land of for-profit medicine south of the border. Morally speaking, it doesn't matter what you do to an organ once it's removed from the individual. But when it's still part of that person and is keeping them alive, uh, then it matters very much <laughs> what you do to it. It may be the ultimate measure of the differences between Canada and the US, healthcare. North of the border, a public system with universal access. To the south, medicine practiced for profit and millions of Americans with no insurance. In both countries, organ procurement is conducted by nonprofit organizations, though many of the American hospitals where transplants take place are in fact private. Organ donation after cardiac death, DCD, was first adopted in the United States in the mid-90s, about a decade before it was here in Canada. Those were early days in the US, when guidelines and safeguards were still being developed, especially at one hospital in Cleveland, Ohio. The Cleveland Clinic, acknowledged as one of the top American hospitals, was among the first to use cardiac death as a way to close the gap between the supply of organs and increasing demand. There's this terrible shortage of organs and a terrible need for them, and transplant physicians are trying to figure out ways to not let so many organs go to waste. Mary Ellen Waite is a professor at Cleveland State University. In 1995, she discovered that a number of doctors at the Cleveland Clinic we're putting together a plan to maximize the quantity and quality of organs for transplant, an admirable objective, until she learned some of the frightening details. The motives were, were good motives. It's the means of pursuing those motives that was morally objectionable and, and you know, questionably legal. Like a medical Ms. Marple, Professor Waite set out to investigate Mystery number one, a drug called heparin, commonly used on organs after they're removed to assure they don't contain blood clots when they're transplanted. But Waite found the Cleveland Clinic planned to give heparin to critically injured donors, not yet declared dead, to preserve their organs. But I said, heparin? They would give heparin to somebody who has a brain bleed because it's a, an anticoagulant, basically. It's a blood thinner. That's what they got. Yeah, so it, it, it would encourage the bleed. It would encourage the bleed in someone who was, by definition, already bleeding. What's more, Waite was shocked by the amount of heparin to be given. These doses were more than five times the norm. And so it was not just the medication, but also the level of dose. And she learned the plan was also to give anesthesia to donors being prepared for organ procurement. Donors presumed to be dead. Why are you giving this if, if my loved one is dead? Right, they're, 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 there's no need for it. It just stands to common sense that if the purpose of anesthesia is to avoid pain, uh, pain can only be felt by living beings, and then that person is not dead, and you don't think he's dead. These are people who are, if not dead, near death. They're certainly heading in that direction definitively. You and I are days. heading in that direction now. <laughs> the question is, how soon? We're all headed towards death. Okay, That's not the issue, whether the person will die. Yes, of course they will die. There's nobody who's immortal. But the question is, how soon and by what means? 
and Professor Waite discovered something else. It was the transcript of a conversation recorded in a conference room at the Cleveland Clinic between transplant surgeons considering how to manipulate monitors in the OR so nurses would think an organ donor had already died when in fact their heart was still beating. And these are people who intend to do good, but somewhere along the line they went crazy. I mean, it is wrong to disconnect ephemeral arterial lead to fool the nurses into thinking yeah. death occurred and the administration of these drugs. For Wade, it was the final straw. She took her evidence to the county prosecutor, who called in surgeons from the Cleveland Clinic to say their plan was nothing short of criminal. And basically read them the riot act and told them that, in his opinion, if this protocol were implemented, it would result in a homicide. And so the implicit threat was that you will be charged with homicide if you do this. That evolving plan at the Cleveland Clinic was never implemented and apparently did not go beyond some well-intentioned, if misguided, physicians at a single U.S. hospital. But Mary Ellen Waite believes shining a light into that dark corner of the organ donation world revealed an important and universal lesson. Morally speaking, it doesn't matter what you do to an organ once it's removed from the individual. But when it's still part of that person and is keeping them alive, uh, then it matters very much <laughs> what you do to it. I mean, it's a, a terrible slippery slope. You don't want to go there at all. You don't want to go there ever. We should emphasize that episode in Cleveland happened almost 20 years ago under a predominantly private health care system and without the benefit of the current Canadian DCD guidelines that some describe as among the most thorough and cautious in the world. But there are many who believe the time has come in Canada for a national discussion of death and dying that the public not only knows about, but participates in. When we come back, the subject that applies to everyone and the debate that should involve us all. It goes to the fundamental question is what is death? I was floating above my body, looking down on my hospital bed with my li limp, lifeless body, and they were weeping, crying, like I had just died in front of them or I was dying in front of them. It is a wonder of modern science to transplant a vital organ from a donor and save the life of someone they may never have met. It's got a much smoother uh, surface, much more normal size than what we're seeing over there. But even with thousands of transplants a year in Canada, thousands of people are on waiting lists, hundreds of whom will die still on the list. It's, I get this transplant and live, or I don't and I die. It's just the reality that you're facing, and it's not something you think you'll face, but when you face it, you're able to, to deal with it. You know, you look at it in the eye and say, bring it on. Why not give someone else a second chance? Hélène Campbell of Ottawa became the face of organ donation. So something good could happen, whether she got her new lungs or not. If that's the purpose, if my death is going to change something here, then I'm all for it. And uh, it was really, you know, it was just a part of not being selfish and just thinking, you know, people are passing away and giving life on, and if it means I'm passing away and giving people a wake-up call, then that's what it was going to be. Success stories like the happy outcome for the Campbell family are why virtually everyone recognizes the urgent need to increase donation. The question is, can that be done while assuring organs are only procured from people who are completely and irreversibly dead? Dr. Sam Shemi of McGill University. People die every day in all hospitals in this country, okay? So what do I want to know if my loved one is dying and might become a donor? I want to know a few things, that they cannot suffer, okay? And we know that the, after your heart stops beating, the brain stops working within seconds, within seconds. That means no consciousness, no suffering, no pain, no awareness, nothing. So that's reassuring to people. Can my loved one suffer? The answer is no. 
But not everyone in critical care in Canada believes the matter is that black and white. To me, the more important question is, can we violate the dead donor rule? And can we allow uh, informed consent to organ donation uh, prior to death? Or the most important question. Choosing his words carefully, Dr. Ari Jaffe of Stollery Children's Hospital in Edmonton has a startling suggestion that the dead donor rule in Canada be changed or ignored, in effect recognizing that in some cases, organs already are being taken from patients near death or on their way to dying, but not dead yet. Do you believe that is already happening? Well, my opinion is uh, that that is happening. Uh, Do you believe it matters that it's happening? Uh, it matters because I don't think the public is fully informed that that debate is occurring. Neither Dr. Jaffe nor anyone else we spoke to suggest that those patients could suddenly revive in any meaningful long-term way, though they believe some slight residual function might still exist. Is the fear or implication there that if organs are harvested after the cessation of breathing and heartbeat, but before all brain activity ceases, somehow there may be sensation, feeling, pain? Some have that concern. I uh, do not think so. Mm -hmm. I think that at five minutes of absent circulation, that the uh, brain is not functioning enough to experience suffering or pain. However, Ari Jaffe admits we don't know that for sure, which is why he has that radical proposal to ease the transition for certain terminal organ donors that uh, we need a debate about whether it would be ethically acceptable to take those patients to the operating room, give them a full anesthetic, and allow organ donation, knowing that it's a contributing cause to the death. It goes to the fund fundamental question is, what is death? It's a question that many physicians in Canada agonize over. The University of Alberta Health Center allows organ donations after cardiac death. Dr. David Zegan is its director of critical care, but he relies only on brain death and won't take DCD cases because he has doubts about whether five minutes is long enough to know that cardiac death is irreversible. Because that's the fundamental question is, is, that, um, is that if we're taking organs from live people, people may have a different view of that. I don't believe that we're doing that. But, um, um, but um, it certainly would be interesting to get more than just the healthcare provider's opinion on this. What happened in September 2006 at the intensive care unit of Vancouver General Hospital reflects the pressures of the life or death issues at stake in this debate. Young, smart, and accomplished athlete 25-year-old Shane Becker was a prime candidate for organ donation. Doctors said he would soon die. In fact, his chart read lethal head injury. His mother had already consented to organ donation. As they waited for his father to drive back to Vancouver to say goodbye to his son, Shane had not yet officially been declared dead. And at his bedside in the ICU, something remarkable happened. Shane's mother, Donna. You believe you felt a, a pressure, a grip? When we were all holding his hand, uh, he did, there was definitely some change in his grasp. It became a little stronger, and, and especially when we spoke to him. Donna Becker, a nurse, alerted the ICU doctors that something seemed to be changing in Shane. His pupils that had been fixed and dilated when we initially went in were now constricted. They had changed in size. I felt very sure that underneath this shell of unresponsiveness, there was actually Shane still there, still with us, trying to tell us it was going to be OK. I was floating above my body, looking down on my hospital bed with my limp, lifeless body. And they were weeping, crying, like I had just died in front of them or I was dying in front of them. This is Shane Becker today. 
His family was told he'd never wake up again. But not only is he alive to tell the tale. Incredibly, Shane says he was there in the ICU with his family all along. I remember trying to communicate with them. Guys, I'm OK. I'm here. I'm fighting. I'm going to make it. And I couldn't. No matter what I tried, I couldn't communicate with them. They couldn't hear me. I remember an overwhelming sense of frustration, but I was there cognitively. I just couldn't show it. Donna Becker says if not for the extra time spent waiting for Shane's dad, it's possible that after all the donation protocols were met, her son's organs might have been removed. It has crossed my mind, what if? Yes, absolutely. There would still be hours of surgery, weeks in a medically induced coma, months of rehab, and years ahead with a damaged brain. But for Shane Becker, now 32, married and a father, it's all a gift he might never have got. And because of all that, Shane has his own unique view of the organ donation and transplant system. I understand that these organs are in high demand. People are, there's long waiting lists for various types of organ donations. And I understand that they save lives. And looking back on it, if I had passed away that night, I would have wanted my body to go to some good use and help people. But on the other side of the story, there's so much of life and medical stuff, more specifically the brain, that they just don't know about and can't explain. In Canada to date, the debate about death has mostly been conducted out of public view. Health lawyer Jacqueline Shaw says that may explain a national survey that showed almost a quarter of Canadians feared physicians might declare death prematurely in order to expedite the procurement of organs. That's a, a serious amount of, of concern in the population, and it could certainly be affecting uh, donation rates. I think that we, we're not doing ourselves justice by, by not providing frank information about death and about the procedures that go on in organ donation to, to patients. Given how profound these issues fundamentally are, is it not something that should be a public debate, not just a debate among professionals? Yeah, again, at the, it, it doesn't play out at the bedside with families. I've been talking to families, and families teach me things. Dr. Sam Shammy of McGill University maintains what the Canadian public needs most of all is trust. Yeah, yeah. But, but if yeah. there's to be truly informed consent, don't those families and, and those of us who aren't yet in that position need to know what the possibilities are, what's at stake? Right, so we know that organ donation saves lives and we know that we have standards in this country that protect patients at the end of life to make sure that all efforts are provided to those patients, but when that can't happen and that patient's gonna die, that we're able to provide the choice to donate, okay? Those standards are in place, the public trust is maintained. I can assure the public that we do a, a great and very credible job in doing that.